I'd like to welcome everyone here. Um, here it's morning in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. And I'm Jennifer Stanley, a teacher with, with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, DC. And this is um, IMCW's second Sunday Dharma series. It's held on the second Sunday each month. And it's an opportunity for you to spend an hour or so with your favorite meditation teachers as they share a little about their life and their relationship to the Dharma and also take your questions. And also remember that you'll receive a link to today's session um, for the recording and that will be um, good for 90 days. And these sessions are fundraisers for IMCW and we greatly appreciate your generosity and the generosity of our guest teachers. And please join us next month on June 13th for Mark Nunberg. He's co-founder of Common Ground Meditation Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he'll share a wide ranging conversation with his friend and IMCW teacher, Deborah Ratner Helzer on how the Dharma has shaped his life over the past four decades. And then coming up over the summer, we'll have teacher Kevin Griffin on July 11th, talking about the Dharma and 12 steps. And our beloved friend, Ruth King will be with us on August 8th. All righty, so let's, uh, and today we have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Kristen Neff, um, but let's take just a quick moment here to settle and arrive before we start our conversation with her. Ah, so your eyes can be partially open or closed, just settling into a comfortable posture whether that's sitting, standing, or lying down. Just feeling the energy and aliveness in the body. Perhaps connecting with the soles of the feet. And breathing in, taking in the nourishment of the air. And breathing out, giving back to the space around you. Connecting with that space around you as you breathe in and breathe out. This exchange, this giving and receiving of the breath is happening all the time in all the moments of our life. Perhaps even letting the breath expand to fill the entire body from head to toe and inside and out. The entire body nourished and, and enlivened by the breath. And when we connect with this vitality and aliveness of the breath, we can also connect with all the ancestors that made this life possible. Biological ancestors, emotional ancestors, cultural and spiritual ancestors, really billions of beings have come together to make this life possible. In that sense, we're never alone.
We have that connection through time to all the ancestors. And because it's Mother's Day, connecting with all of the mothers that made this life possible. And may you receive this blessing poem written by IMCW teacher, Shel Fisher. A prayer for everyone today, each one of us, to all the mothers or to all those who are mothers, to all those who are not mothers, to all mothers who are grieving their children, to all who are grieving their mothers. May we all remember that according to the Buddhist teachings, we have all at some point been mothers to one another. May we remember that each of us mothers, that we all give and care and take care of one another in so many ways. May we honor our mother earth who sustains and takes care of all of us. May we vow to honor and see the goodness in all beings and take care of one another. May all beings feel cared for, cherished, held, and loved. With blessings to all. So <clears throat> today we have um, Dr. Krista Neff with us. Um, just briefly, she received her doc doctorate at the University of California at Berkeley and is now an associate profes professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. And it was in her last year of graduate school that she became interested in Buddhism and has been practicing meditation in the insight meditation tradition ever since. And it was while she was doing her postdoctoral work that she decided to conduct research on self-compassion. And um, you can think of her as like the, the mother pioneer of self-compassion and has created a scale that is um, more than 20 years old now. And she's published numerous um, academic articles and book chapters on self-compassion, um, notably the book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. And next month, um, we're excited to um, be able to read her, her latest book, Fierce Compassion, How Women Can Harness Kindness to Speak Up, Claim Their Power, and Thrive. Um, she also, with Chris Germer, created the Mindful Self-Compassion Program and um, created all the materials for that, like the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook and um, the Teaching Guide on Mindful Self-Compassion. And she's also the co-founder of the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. And I myself, along with Jeff Rosenberg, have taught the Mindful Self-Compassion eight-week course um, more than 20 times since 2014 and have seen its benefits in literally hundreds of our students. Um, so many times people tell us how the series is life-changing ch and um, you know, thousands of teachers around the world are teaching this. So it's, it's really creating uh, self-compassion and compassion revolution in the world. And just thank you so much for being with us here today, Kristen. It's really a joy and a pleasure to be with you again. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here and honored to be here on Mother's Day, especially um, to really honor this 
really important day. Now, I am a mother, but to all the mothers out there, including my mother, it's really wonderful to be here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, to begin, we're going to um, have a conversation here. And so, um, you know, one of the things um, probably that some people are curious about is, you know, what is fierce compassion? That doesn't always seem notable to people initially. Yeah, well, especially so I'm uh, fierce self-compassion, right? So and, and so the idea of fierce compassion is actually a, a Buddhist notion. I learned about the term fierce compassion from Buddhist teachers like Sharon Salzberg, who talks about it, and a few teachers talk about it. And so what had happened is, you know, I've been doing my work on self-compassion for, for many, many years. And I started seeing that people had a really one-sided view of compassion. They tended to, you know, more easily understand what I, I call the tender side of self-compassion. This is the part of self-compassion that allows us just to be with ourselves as we are. It's, it's like what Tara Brock calls radical self-acceptance. Rad, not only self-acceptance, but radical acceptance in general. So the ability to open our heart to what is, including ourselves, is really um, one of the most important aspects of self-compassion. And, and research-wise, you know, what we know is that it allows us to be much less depressed, less anxious, happier, because it feels good to have an open heart. But, you know, self-compassion is not only being with what is, because compassion, really, if you look at the word in, in science, is defined as the motivation to alleviate suffering. Right. You look at a brain on compassion that the parts of the brain associated with planned movement become activated. It's this desire to do something to help. And so sometimes what we need to alleviate our suffering is radical self-acceptance, but sometimes to alleviate our suffering, we need to do something, right? We may need to like stand up for ourselves. We need, may need to fight injustice. I mean, look at the Me Too movement. The Black Lives Matter movements. I see these as self-compassion movements. People saying, you cannot treat me this way. That's self-compassion, right? Also, sometimes, you know, doing things to meet our needs, actually taking action to meet our needs and saying, I count too. And motivating change. I mean, sometimes <laughs> the most compassionate thing to do is to change something about yourself. Not not that you're not acceptable as you are, but maybe your behavior needs to, needs a little work <laughs> or a situation you're in needs to change. And so that's what I like to call the fierce side of self-compassion. So again, the, the idea of using compassion is like almost like as a weapon of good, of mm -hmm. justice, is old in Buddhism, and fierce compassion. So I just kind of talk about that we can also harness that energy for ourselves as well. It goes inward and outward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of eliminating that distinction between self and other. It's like, you know, where were they in and of ourselves just as others are worthy of protection. Right. And if you think about it, I mean, that's why that, you know, I think that's why I, if I had been practicing Buddhism, my ideas of, on this would have been very different. Um, because if you really look at radical interbeing or radical interdependence, it doesn't make sense to only aim compassion outward and not inward. And, it, and it's funny because some of my Buddhist friends say like, but there's the S word, self-compassion. Isn't the self the problem? But you know, the lack of self-compassion, which is shame and self-judgment, that's S with a capital S. <laughs> self-compassion just meaning you're including yourself in the circle of compassion. You, you aren't differentiating yourself. That actually reduces the sense of separate self. And, and the research supports that. And, and you can actually, if you don't like the word self-compassion, you can just call it inner compassion, right. inner and outer. It means the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, what inspired you to write a book about um, fierce self-compassion just for women? You know, like what about men and, yeah. you know, what about gender fluid people? Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I feel kind of badly because I, I've been posting a lot about uh, fear, self-compassion, my book for a woman, and I've had men saying, but what about me? Um, and it, it was a choice I made just because, you know, the, the, a book would have to look a little bit different for a man. And I, and I tried writing it at first, well, from woman's point of view and from men's point of view, but it was just too convoluted. So here's the thing, fierce and tender self-compassion, they're both 
essential for well-being. And uh, more importantly, they need to be integrated and balanced for well-being. Uh, I, I like to use the metaphor of yin and yang. I actually like that better than masculine and feminine because the whole problem is we've gendered these things, right? So the yin energy is more the accepting, tender energy. The yang energy is more the active, um, you know, fierce energy. And really to have well-being, we need both. If we're too tender and accepting and we aren't fierce enough, if we don't like say no, stand up for ourselves, well, we might become complacent. Or, you know, we can't just like sit on our cushions and be well when the world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? Sometimes we need to do something. So tenderness without enough fierceness can be complacency. But on the other hand, too much fierceness without tenderness becomes like hostility and endless striving and driving. And, you know, that's not good either. I mean, in many ways, if you look at the big problems in the world, it's, be it's because we have too much fierceness without enough tenderness. But what's happened, I think really unfortunately for everyone, regardless of gender identity, is that we've gendered these things, right? So boys, they're encouraged to be fierce, they're encouraged to be brave, people like fierce boys. They actually like it when a man's angry, they look up to an angry man, they respect him more, they think he's more powerful. But if a man is too tender, too soft, you know, he gets called names, especially as a young child, he gets belittled. And so men, really start to shut down their tender side, which really harms men because it means they don't have access to this incredible, powerful tool of emotional healing and resilience, which is radical self-acceptance and tenderness. Women, on the other hand, they're socialized to be tender versus all well, the other people. They aren't actually socialized to be compassionate to themselves. That's selfish. So that's one problem, but also, you know, so they're more comfortable with the idea of tenderness. That's why like 85% of the people who come to my workshops are women. But if women, and especially starting in girlhood, if they're too fierce or if they get angry or if they have that really powerful go-getter energy, people don't really like girls and women like that. Um, there's actually a lot of research that shows if a woman is too young, if she's too forceful, people don't like her. Women, by the way, this is all unconscious. They don't realize they're doing it, but people don't like her. They think she's mean. They call her names. Um, and that harm, you wonder why there's a glass ceiling? It's because we need to be fierce to make it to the top levels, but people don't like fierce women. So people think, well, but she's got problems or she's kind of out of control or, you know, and that, that's a huge problem. So we gendered these things that are supposed to be integrated for everyone for health and well-being. So, so that's a problem. And so, and, and again, it doesn't matter if you're cisgender or transgender or gender fluid, right? It really doesn't matter where you are because every human being has, will have a natural way to express yin and yang, right? Fierceness and tenderness. And every single human being is going to benefit from developing both, integrating both in their own unique way. But gender role socialization stuffs us into these little boxes that constrain us. Not only do they constrain us, they, they underlie patriarchy. Right. One of the ways patriarchy is maintained is by men get the power through their fierceness and women are consigned to be helpmates because they're tender and nice and that's what nice women do. So it's, it's, it's a problem. And so again, I would love to have had the ability to write a book for men, people social, and I should say people socialized as men. I don't even think there is an actual male or female, but people who are socialized as, as male, the book that needs to be written for them is tender self-compassion, how men can <laughs> harness tenderness to like, to like wake up and deal with their emotions in an emotionally productive way and like being emotionally intelligent. It, it would be a slightly different book. And it was just too convoluted to, to um, do both. So that's one reason. And then the second reason is the Me Too movement mm -hmm. in terms of like why I personally wrote this book. I had a really horrible, horrific experience with um, someone in my life who turned out to be a sex predator. It was kind of, he was like a mini Harvey Weinstein. You know, and I'm not alone. I mean, me too. There are, there are yeah. millions around the globe. And women are starting to talk about it. Yeah, me too. I, yeah, it happened to you too? Yeah, well, me, me too. And I was so enraged by the situation that it's like, I got to write a book for my sisters about how we're going to deal with this. 
Um, and that, that I, and I know that one of the ways to deal with it is to call up this fierceness. Mm. Um, so yeah, that, wow. that's, <laughs> that's why. So I apologize to all the men. I'm trying to get my colleague, Chris Germer to write the book for men. Cause I'm actually not very qualified, not being raised as a man, <laughs> but it needs to be written. <laughs> that Everyone is, needs both. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that, that is great. I mean, women need it so much, um, all yeah. around the world really. Yeah. And, and that's, um, you know, just hearing you speak right now, it really resonates how, how it can really revolutionize relationships and, uh, societies overall. I mean, it's a huge change. It's a political act as well as a yeah. personal act. If you think about it, because it means that these gender roles, which have been used in many ways to oppress women for hundreds, mm -hmm. thousands, actually, probably since the uh, agrarian, agrarian um, agricultural revolution, sorry. As soon yeah. as we went from hunter gatherers to agriculture, that's when patriarchy really started. And that's when the gender roles of socialization really started getting very entrenched. Yeah. And since then, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've been used in many ways to oppress women. Yeah. Uh, you know, and by the way, it, so yeah, so I, I would consider myself a feminist, but it's really about human flourishing. That's really what's motivating me, human flourishing for everyone, because everyone is harmed by this, right. not just women. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's really inspiring. It also, um, you know, makes me think about um, oh, I just want to mention too, if you have questions for Kristen, you can um, uh, send those questions in the chat to, um, I think it's listed in there, send questions here. Yeah, ask questions here of that, um, of that particular place, and then um, they'll send them to me. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about, you know, today is Mother's Day, and you know, how is fierce compassion, you know, relevant to mothers and to other caregivers? Yeah, so, um, and I love the fact that it's Mother's Day um, because it's interesting, you know, even though, even though fierceness is part of the male gender role, there are certain contexts in which this fierceness is part of the female gender role. Uh, and that's what I like to call mama bear energy. Right, and every woman, whether or not you have children, has the ability to tap into this inner fierceness. So it's allowed to come out to protect our children or protect our loved ones. Um, and then the idea is we're harnessing it for ourselves. So if you think about it, the tender self-compassion, metaphorically, it's kind of like mother, you know, the ability, we just love our children unconditionally. And even if they're crying or they just spit up on our blouse or whatever's going on, you know, we just love them as we are. And we have the ability to kind of soothe them and comfort them and reassure them of our unconditional love and acceptance. And that's really in some ways what um, epitomizes tender self-compassion. But this fierce mama bear, I mean, you want to see me get angry? I write about this a lot in the book. You do anything at all threatened to my, threatening to my son? Oh my, you know, you watch someone get angry, right? So that fierceness, that fierce protective energy, that's we, the idea is we're used to being allowed to use that for others. And this, this is really about giving us permission to use that to protect ourselves. And again, it's not only protection, um, providing, again, part of the mother role is you know doing whatever we can for our kids, meeting their needs, constantly meeting their needs. What do you need? And again, especially with our kids, we've, we've learned to do that really well to meet our children's needs or to meet our spouse's needs or to meet our elderly parents' needs. So we're really good at meeting needs. Yeah. Except there's one person we leave out and that's our own. So again, we use that, we turn that make a U-turn to really meet our own needs, right? And then of course, motivating change. And so, and I also have to say the other metaphor that really captures this fierceness. Um, so I've got a picture of her on my wall. If you were to go in my bedroom, right above my meditation cushion is an image of Kali, the Hindu goddess Kali. And, you know, if you talk to most women, they can feel that inside them, that the Kali energy, this it's, um, even though it's part of the male gender role, it's actually in many cultures considered a feminine energy. It's the energy of destruction. 
and immediately think, oh no, I mean, if you look at Kali, right? She's got, she's got a necklace of severed heads, <laughs> but what does she destroy? She destroys illusion. Yeah. That's what she destroys. She destroys the illusion of separation, yeah. right? And so, and that, so that fierce, powerful energy. And by the way, I've struggled with it all my life. I'm, I'm really a lot more young than yin, just by nature, my personality. You know, you, I'd be more masculine from a gender role person. I mean, not with my son. With my son, I can be very tender. But like in the work world, I think part of the reason I'm, you know, have succeeded, or it's because I'm, I, I, you know, I'm kind of a warrior. I've got a lot of warrior energy. And I also struggle with anger. Well, we can talk about anger in a little bit, but, um, and I've always seen this as something that I kind of need to manage. I've always, you know, maybe has some shame around it. Um, felt like, okay, I need to use my mindfulness practice to, you know, make sure that I don't, you know, overuse it. And even though that's true, what I realized when I was, is right before I wrote the book, one of the reasons I wrote it is that this is my power source. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had to change my personality so that I didn't have that, even though it does get me into trouble sometimes, and I do try to work with it, I'm not gonna say that it doesn't. I mean, there's some people that I've harmed because of it, and I really wish I had it. And I'm really good at apologizing. <laughs> but if I could snap my fingers and erase that part of my personality, no way would I do that because that's, that's you know, being able to tap in to that, volcanic force of Kali has really allowed me to do so much in my life. And I started realizing that we denigrate this side, women especially, because we're so raised, we aren't supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be nice and sweet, you know, and, and, and people get really scared if we're too fierce. And I realized I need to own my fierceness. Mm -hmm. um, Sonia uh, Chamali, she wrote a book called Rage Becomes Her. And she says, um, what did she say? Uh, Rage doesn't get in the way. Rage is our way. We just have to own it. Mm. And again, we, we can unpack that because there's healthy and unhealthy anger. But right. part of the problem is that we denigrate this source, especially women, because people think we're, they, they love angry men. Like Brett Kavanaugh, he got elected to the Supreme Court because he was so angry. You know, women, they think we're crazy and they don't believe us and they ridicule us. You know, that's the, that's the problem because we're, we're, and on purpose. I'm sorry, but it's on purpose that we're cut off from this power source. And I'm just not going to have it anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't like me? Sorry. <laughs> you you know? Change the channel. Right? I can like myself. I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing with self-compassion. You don't need people to like you and think you're nice. You can actually like yourself. You can love yourself. You can give yourself the unconditional love and support and care that we're hoping to get from others. And we do get from others if we conform by the rules. Right. And we can say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to play by your rules. I'm going to make my own rules. Yeah. You yeah. know, Kristen, as you are talking. We am fired up on this. I know, this. and I love it. <laughs> but you know, it also makes me think that, you know, it's, it's a way of also, um, you know, owning this energy and actually, and giving it towards ourselves, we don't deplete ourselves. We don't deplete ourselves. You know, because a lot of times you're just always aiming it outward, whether it's yang compassion or yin compassion. Or, and you, yes. And, but you can turn it towards yourself. Yes. Then, then that is a, you know, regenerative. regenerative yes. Kind of thing. And, and there's a lot of research on this. Um, and, and so I think the yin and the yang energy, um, they play a slightly different function. Um, and so, by the way, just to say the research hasn't yet, it may, may come, hasn't really differentiated. Like, I don't have a measure of fierce self-compassion versus tender self-compassion. There are, there are some proxy things like emotion-focused coping versus problems-focused coping. And self-compassion leads to both. Mm -hmm. But um, none, nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of work with caregivers, whether you're a professional caregiver, whether you're a parent, uh, whether you're uh, dealing with cancer, a very difficult situation, um, like, like, a, like a spouse or someone who has a very uh, cancer, something very traumatic. The more self-compassion we have, the less we're likely to burn out from caring for others. Yeah. So yeah. absolutely, the more we replenish ourselves, yeah. and that means, and, and two things, one is ra radical love and acceptance of the pain of that, it hurts. You know, as a mother of an autistic child, you know, I can tell you how hard it was. Uh, and self-compassion is 
is what got me through. I don't know how, when I, I guess I would have survived, but it would have been a lot more difficult. So the tender self-compassion allows us to hold the pain of it um, or the pain of our loved one who's hurting or the pain of that patient who's dying in front of us. And think of our healthcare workers. It helps us to hold the pain of that, to nurture us, to soothe ourselves, to say, hey, I'm here for you. And then the fear self-compassion is also things like drawing boundaries. You know, if we just give and give and give and deplete ourselves, we aren't helping anyone. So sometimes we have to say, I would love to be able to help you, but I'm sorry, I can't. I need to do this for myself. That's more that fear side. Both are essential not to burn out. Yeah, you know, I can, I can really vouch for that. My mom died of cancer four and a half years ago. And, you know, just going through that whole process, she wasn't even diagnosed until the last 20 hours of her life, actually. They, oh it was like a huge mistake on their part. And so for 13 months, you know, struggling, you know, giving my learning that I had to give myself compassion and then also standing up to the healthcare system, advocating for my mom. It was really, I mean, without that practice, you know, it, it would have been impossible really. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, you have talked um, about the anger. The, the one thing that came to mind is I'm definitely more of on the yin side of, uh -huh. of things, but, uh, and sometimes I think about how, you know, I have a big lighter in one hand and a flamethrower in the other. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's really about learning how to kind of moderate that so I can, you know, so I don't necessarily torch the landscape or, you know, yes. not be seen. Yeah. And I think for a woman in particular, because women are so socialized against anger, I mean, so an upset child, if it's a boy, right, they'll say, oh, you're angry. If it's a girl, they'll say you're sad. So women's anger is invalidated from a very young age. And so women are taught that anger is this foreign thing. So when women describe their anger, they talk about being taken over by anger. It's because they don't own it. They don't see it as part of their nature because their whole life they've been taught that that's not, that's not part of you. And so I think what happens is we repress it. We know what happens in, <laughs> for meditation practice. What happens when you <laughs> repress things? It doesn't work so well. Like what resistance makes it stronger, right? So we resist it, we deny it. And then you're right, it gets ignited. And then we feel like, who was that? That wasn't me. We don't own it, we don't integrate it. But so there, there, is, there is research on this. There is constructive and dest destructive anger. What's the difference? It's actually pretty simple. Constructive anger works in the service of alleviating suffering, mm -hmm. right? So the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, a lot of these social justice movements. I mean, I'm sorry, if you aren't angry, you're asleep. There's a lot to be angry about, you know? So when that anger can be harnessed in the service of alleviating suffering, right? So now the saying no, drawing the line in the stand, having courage, anger gives us courage, it reduces the fear response, it focuses us, it energizes us. These are really healthy things. But if that anger starts, at some point spills over from preventing harm and saying no, and starts causing harm, by making the people who are we think are harming us the enemy or getting personal or mean or like really harming others, then it starts to be destructive. Mm -hmm. And not only for the other people, also internally, right? So if, if at some point we're holding so much anger that it's harming us, it's like exhausting us, we're ruminating on the anger, then again, it's no longer in the service of alleviating suffering. And so, and by the way, I say this not as an expert who's totally figured out their anger, has got it all together, man, I'm so cool. It's not like that. It's like, I still struggle with it. Um, and it's because part of it is just how we're wired, you know? And so it's like, you get off balance and then you refine balance. You get off balance and you refine balance. It's more of a process as opposed to a linear destination. Right. But I can say as someone who gets it wrong a lot, <laughs> that it works when you get it right. You know, and it's worth trying to achieve that balance. And so in my book, for instance, I have a whole chapter on anger and I've got exercises and practices mm -hmm. to try to help us work with the energy. Wow. But it, we have to stop seeing it as bad, right? The whole, it's, it's actually a neutral energy and it can really be used for good. We just have to be very conscious and intentional about are we using this to alleviate suffering or is it actually inadvertently causing suffering? Right, 
lives. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, as you were speaking, it was making me think about how backdraft is part of the, you know, the mindful self-compassion program. Do you yeah. also look at backdraft in terms of fierce self-compassion as well? Oh, that, that's really interesting, Jennifer. I've, I've never I've never thought of that before. So let me just explain for people who don't know the Mindful Self-Compassion Program. Let me explain what Backdraft is. So Backdraft um, actually tends to arrive, which we're used to thinking of it as something that arises when we give ourselves tender self-compassion. So what happens is, um, you know, if we shut down our hearts our whole life to kind of deal with the pain, could be early childhood trauma, it could be getting a lot of criticism, it could just be difficult circumstances in life, the way we dealt with it, you know, really, in a way, a good plan to just to try to survive. Okay, I'm gonna close down my heart, and I'm just gonna to try to get through. And it's kind of worked for us, but at some point, if we close our heart so much, then we are, our hearts aren't open, and that's a problem. So in self-compassion, especially tender self-compassion, when we start to open and accept the pain, right, that's, that's already there, then sometimes what happens is we open our hearts and the love rushes in and the old pain rushes out. And the reason it's called backdraft is it's like a fire, you know, if the doors are shut on a fire and you open the doors, air rushes in, flames rush out. Um, fear self-compassion, I think actually that probably could be, um, I think sometimes the backdraft could express itself as fierce, as fierceness. Mm. Right. So whether or not it's self-compassion in that moment, I think it would, it would kind of maybe depend. Right. Sometimes, yes. Maybe sometimes it's it's just anger with without aimed at good. So, I, you know, again, you know, I, I, before I before I say that analogy, I'm not, I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Um, but really what I do know is fear self-compassion is something that ha needs to come consciously. Hmm. It's not just reacting. It's not just exploding. It's not, that's not really fear self-compassion. That's just exploding or kind of um, ang angry reactivity. Fear self-compassion is conscious and it's intentional, right? And that's why it's kind of difficult to do and why we've got to develop it. It's like, okay, I'm doing this. There's a lot of mindfulness in fear self-compassion. It's not mindless. That's really important. Mindfulness practice is the foundation of all of these things. Without mindfulness, you can't really do much of anything. Right. And it has to be answering that conscious question. What do I need right now? What, what's healthy? What, what's going to lead to well-being? Right. So I think mm -hmm. backdraft is often more just reactivity. But, it, it, you know, but for, for some some part of us, though, is trying to protect ourselves. And so right. some part of us, even though it's not conscious, is actually trying to help us. Self-criticism. It's actually part of us trying to help ourselves, trying to be safe, trying to keep ourselves in line and control our behavior so that we don't get harmed. Right. You know, so it's really just taking these unconscious impulses and trying to make them conscious and intentional, especially with the mindfulness so that we can harness them more productively. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I know in the moments where I've really had a lot of fierce self-compassion you know I've also had like this uh, seed of calm in there that sort yes. of kept me anchored um so I wasn't like you know out of control or anything like that yeah. just very so, laser focused so it's all about integrating them right and so for instance in, in the practices of my book almost every single one ends with the type of integration mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to do a, 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 pr a practice at the end of this session a short meditation where we use the breath to try to integrate the two energies. And by the way, integration is challenging. It's not really easy, and it takes work and it takes practice. Um, and uh, I'm still I'm still in the midst of my practice. I, I like to joke that I, the goal of practice is a compassionate mess. It's like it's not like you get it. You know, it's like you're still a mess, but you try to hold it with compassion. And again, it's that it's that process. You get off balance and you rebalance, and you know you do that. And eventually, over time, it does get a little easier. I mean especially with a meditation practice, you can actually rewire the, the habits of your brain, which is really helpful. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we have several questions here from folks. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, just talking about integration, you know, it can be hard if there's a lot of early childhood trauma and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, you know, how can, how can we, um, you know, maybe deal with that. 
can fierce compassion help us with that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so it's interesting. Compassion focused therapy is a therapeutic approach specifically designed to teach people with early childhood trauma self compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and people with early childhood trauma have a lot of backdraft. Uh, Paul Gilbert is actually, he developed a scale called fear of self-compassion mm -hmm. because for people with whom the, you know, the early childhood experiences, love and care and compassion is supposed to make you feel safe. Yeah. And if in fact it didn't make you feel safe because of your family history, uh, what happens is like the signals of fear get intermixed with the signals of care. And giving yourself compassion or care can actually feel scary because all these memories come up. And so, um, you know, he works with that explicitly. It's a, it's a really effective way of working with it. And he, he's one of the people that he has always talked about. He didn't use the word fear self-compassion, but he's always talked about it as a type of bravery, a type of courage. In other words, you, you, do, need, you do need both. So the ability to be tender, to hold the pain of that, right, is, is a really important aspect. So, um, you know, you might say that in baby steps, and it's hard, it's not like you can snap your fingers, and it often takes the help of a therapist, but you can, over time, learn to give yourself what you didn't get from your parents, yeah. right? Give yourself that acceptance, that support, uh, and that warmth. And at the same time, you can learn to kind of start to stand up for yourself more, to draw your boundaries. And again, it can be scary because maybe as a child, if you stood up for yourself, there'd be really serious consequences. And so again, just to survive, you had to shut that down. You don't wanna shame yourself or blame yourself for that. Unfortunately, a lot of people do, they internalize their experience and with shame. And so it's, again, it's, it's always a matter of, you know, Chris and I, Chris Germer and I like to say that self-compassion really is just answering the question, what do I need right now? Mm, right. And we need different things. Sometimes we need more tenderness. Sometimes we need more fierceness, right? Sometimes we need to go left. Sometimes we need to go right. Um, and no one from the outside can really tell you what the right answer is. It's, you know, it's not like, dear Abby, what do I do? It, it really just depends on so many, you know, the complexity of interdependence is just huge. And that's why wisdom has an important role self-compassion like that poem you read that was so beautiful you know the, the interconnection the wisdom of just really it just it just pausing and saying what do i really need right now you know and kind of trusting that if you answer that question sincerely and you're willing to support and help yourself which means sometimes what you need may be to like stand up to someone which may be scary but th that's why Kindness in the service of protection gives you strength and bravery and courage. It's one of the things it does. Yeah. Then, you know, again, then it's, you'll, you'll kind of know what to do. But it can really be helpful to have a good therapist, especially if you're dealing mm -hmm. with early childhood trauma. Yeah. Because it's, it's complicated. Absolutely. You know, in, in the students we've had, um, I think one of the things that we encourage them is to be patient with themselves because, yes. you know, they expect it to come immediately. Like it's yes. an app, you know, okay, I need the answer. And you need to experiment a lot of times and be patient yeah. and let it uh, arise what you need and how to do it. And also it's not, like you, it's not like you arrive and you get there. Again, going back to the, the goal of compassion, the goal of practice is simply to be a compassionate mess. I'm still a mess after 30 years of practice. You know, I'm a little less messy maybe than I used to be, but I'm, I'm still a mess, you know, and the, but that's not your goal. Your goal is not perfection. Your goal is simply to open your heart. And if your heart is open toward whatever is happening, you've actually achieved your goal. And it allows you to function when your heart is open yeah. in a way that's more difficult when it's shut down. Yeah. Um, we have another question, you know, people or several questions, people, um, uh, sometimes it's more easy to be compassionate, self-compassionate with the vulnerable side of themselves, but not so much uh, with the angry judgmental side of themselves. They can really yeah. struggle with that. Yeah, that, that's right. And that's very, very true. So the kind of the, the um, kind of wounded parts of ourselves, the, the fearful parts of ourselves, the hurt parts of ourselves. Uh, in, in some ways it is easier because we, we kind of see that as more innocent somehow. 
Mm -hmm. to have compassion for those parts. And the parts it's more difficult are that, you know, and by the way, you know, I deal with this. Like I say, I, I struggle with reactive anger. You know, I don't try to hide this. That's why I'm not giving a Dharma talk. I don't consider myself a Dharma teacher. I consider myself a human being who's figured out some things that help. But, you know, so, you know, I, I know what that's like. And, and that's, and largely my book is kind of about this, right? I've got this side, I, I say it's more bulldog than mama bear. Like, you know, sometimes I have a part of me that I call bulldog because sometimes bulldog barks and, and it's not that pretty, you know, and I, I've hurt people, you know, again, I'm really good at apologizing, but a lot of shame arises around that part of it. I don't really, I admit it, I don't really like that part of myself. Um, and I think, you know, everyone has their own version of this. I'm not the only one, right? Everyone has some parts of themselves that it's easier, to, hard, more difficult to embrace. Uh, and that's, but that's really uh, what I came to learn, what I came to see is that all these parts of ourselves actually do play an essential role and are necessary. Like I say, I know my, my bulldog it's been really essential to my ability to, um, to succeed, how, you know, to, to achieve what I've achieved in life. Self-criticism, for instance, the way you deal with self-criticism is by having compassion for it. And, and it, it is difficult, but it, once you understand, whether it's my bulldog, whether it's an inner critic, whether it's whatever it is, that these are parts of ourselves that are really just trying to help us and protect us. That's their whole function. That's what they do. And they often develop when we are very young and we didn't have a lot of wisdom and we didn't have a lot of maturity. And they're also related to our um, instincts, like the fight, flight, or freeze response. We didn't, you know, our reptilian brain, we didn't choose to have that. That's like passed on from evolution, right? But yet the reason it evolved was to help us survive. And so the more we can learn to, to understand that those parts of ourselves that maybe we don't like so much and that it's harder, the more we can actually see, well, why is it here? Right. And almost, almost always the reason why it's there is it's at some level, it's trying to keep you safe. Even if it's not working out very well, right. it's trying to keep you safe. And the more we can actually honor and have compassion for those parts of ourselves that are trying to keep us safe, even though it may be in a malproductive way, the more able we are to um, actually find new ways of trying to keep ourselves safe. Yeah. Um, but but that it's it's very it's very common, you know. The path isn't an easy one, but but here's the amazing thing, Jennifer. I can tell you. Some of my, my most challenging moments of just kind of shame, and I can't believe I did that, and just really dark times. When I've been able to open my heart to that, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful experience, you know, because what you're open, and it's not like, and I, and that's why I love, that's why Tara, she's probably my, I shouldn't say my favorite teacher, but she, she is my favorite teacher. Sorry, I'm going to admit it. Tara is my favorite teacher because she's so, I love the way she's able to, always connect to the bigger picture yeah. because the love you're tapping into it's not really generated from our small self this ability to hold everything with love this is the big self this is this is the biggie <laughs> you know <clears throat> you can call it god you can call it the planet earth you can call it the divine mother you can call it <clears throat> interdependence right. you know but what is pointing to when we really open the even opening to our anger and our shame and our like and our meanness and our pettiness and our jealousy and all the ugly stuff of life, when we can really open to that, what we're doing is we're immediately, instead of being identified with it, that's, that's the cool thing. Instead of being lost in it or identified with it, you're rising above it and you're seeing it from this other perspective. And that perspective isn't of the small self. At that moment, we are actually relating from the perspective of the big self right yeah. uh, and it, it's just so it's such a beautiful beautiful practice how we can take any moment the darkest moment mm -hmm. and if we hold it with love it becomes a beautiful moment right you know and it as you were saying that I was thinking that's like the quintessential rebalancing of power isn't it yes taking it from the small self to the big self yes yeah, yeah. and that and that's ultimately what the practice yeah. is about it's, uh, it, you know, I like, I, I, yeah, I'm not a Dharma teacher. 
and I'm a scientist and all those, all those things, but it really is ultimately a spiritual practice. Yeah. Because it inevitably leads you to this place if you take it deeply enough. Yeah. Um, let's see, we've got some questions here. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, okay, so it looks like somebody's agreeing Chris should write that book on the <laughs> inside. Um, and, yeah. But this, this is a male identified person, he said, but he's also needs fierce self compassion. Yeah. Um, you know, well, and also the, the combining it with tenderness, right? And I think that's the, the way one of the ways that men have been harmed is because tenderness is associated with the lack of power because it's a female, it's consigned to be a female thing. Um, it harms men that they aren't able to integrate their fierceness. And I, not all men, I mean, to my mind, if you look at like what Martin Luther King was talking about or Gandhi, I mean, some of these great leaders of social change, yeah. that was the combining of the fierceness and tenderness of the, the power with love. You know, it's a beautiful writings about this. Um, but yeah, and so I, by the way, I've had several men read my book, and they all said they got a lot out of it. You know, one for one thing, they kind of were able to understand some of the female perspective, and they were allies. But the practices themselves are gender neutral. Mm. Right? Again, the practices are all about integrating the fierceness and tenderness. And um, so, I think from that point of view, it, it could be useful until Chris writes his book, maybe we can sign a petition or some, maybe one of the people listening can write that book. I mean, it, it needs to be written, but I actually, I don't have enough life experience to be able to write that book. But so for instance, if you look at the number one predictor of like sexual harassment or sexual assault, it, it's toxic masculinity. What is toxic masculinity? It's fierceness without any tenderness, right? It's all about the anger and the power without the open-heartedness and that harms everyone. Right. Um, you know, somebody was asking, uh, this is a male uh, identified person was wondering how he can support women in their development of fierce compassion. Well, so um, one really big thing is by not shying away from Kali. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you, so I have a, my, my best friend, Kelly and I, we, we like, to, we both have a lot of Kali energy. And it is funny. I mean, I, I can't, I can't really disentangle, do, is it the same energy that comes to a male identified person? I, I'm not sure. I mean, if you get into like Jungian archetypes, there may be differences, you know, animus and anima. But I can tell you that um, a lot of men are very frightened by that energy, mm -hmm. partly because they aren't used to seeing it, but partly because it is a powerful energy, right? That, that, and it's, Again, I, I, I'm not in the position to say is it a different energy that's channeled through people who identify as women or men. I don't know, it's an interesting question, but I do know that men, it's, it scares the bejeebers out of them right. to be in the presence of a woman's Kali energy. Uh, and yes, you, you know, as a man, you do not have to allow people to you know, put it on you or you know, to criticize you, you need to draw your boundaries. But you know, just to, to honor that, and to be able to hold a woman's fierceness, you know, again, as long as she's not calling you names or, you know, she's, she's just, but just if she's channeling that energy, I mean, uh, if I could find a man who could hold my collie, I'd be so happy. <laughs> okay. That's another story. I'm single right now. So that's like a whole, we can go there, but you know, a lot of this, but that, I think that's one of the biggest gifts men could give to women. Yeah. is to honor their fierceness because that is a power source. And could you imagine if men, if women were fully allowed an equal place at the tables of power? And, it, and the thing is, it's not, women are not just about childcare. They're, yeah, that's part of that. There's part of that voice, but it's not the only part of that voice. Right. Another part of the woman's voice is this Kali, which remember, what does Kali do? She's scary. Yes, she, she may cut your head off. But what she's really doing is destroying illusion, the illusion of separation. That's what it's really all about. And so the more men, I think, allow women to be their 
full selves, to really just grow in and express their full selves. I think it'll help the world because um, I think we aren't gonna get out of this mess we're in without the full participation of women. Um, and, and there may be something, I don't know about the fact that the ability to bear children may make the quality of mom and bear energy a little different. You know, and again, not to, I don't, you know, men also have unique qualities, maybe a warrior energy that's a little different. I don't, I don't want to get too far down into that. But um, what I do know, what I can say, and also a lot of people don't identify with either male or female, you know, they're kind of um, gender neutral. If, if everyone was allowed to express their full authentic self and was celebrated for it and supported for it, do you imagine how much more effective we'd be as a planet, as a, as a people, <laughs> you know? And if, if we can do that, that'd be a wonderful gift to the world. Oh, it would, it would be spectacular. Um, somebody also um, asked a quiz, quick question. They were wondering about the big self and the small self. I mean, the small okay. self is more ego identified. But... Yes, yeah, I mean, that's it, right? Ego identification, right? Um, and so, you might say self-compassion is, is the big self, not the small self. Because right. the moment the moment ego gets identified, that's when it all starts going haywire, right? right. Where there's anger, right? When the anger becomes ego-driven anger, forget it, you right. know? Or, or when the judgment becomes ego-identified, then that's very harmful. Um, anytime, well, you know, you guys are an insight meditation song. So this is, this is one of the truths, the, the real gifts, I think, of, the practice of insight meditation or Buddhism in general is deep insight into the suffering caused by identification with ego. Yeah. Um, and so I, it, but it's interesting, isn't it? When we let go of identification with ego, it's not just radical acceptance that arises. Radical change also arises. Yeah. Um, nature is sometimes calm streams and peaceful forest glades. And sometimes nature is tornadoes and volcanoes. It's all part of it, right? And so I think at least, at least how I see my own, my own role in this is like, I'm just as much as I can, if I can just get out of the way, mm -hmm. you know, and just allow it to move through me in the direction that it wants yeah. to move. Um, I, I, and, and by the way, it's like, I, I do, I, I think everyone does, but of course, so, so my, when I talk about this, the last chapter in my book, I really go into my own journey with this very more deeply and my journey, my personal journey, it has been to let go. I mean, my, my main meditation practice is now just may let go, but no longer serves me. And I release things at an energetic level. I don't even know what I'm releasing anymore. It's so deep. I don't even put, I had no idea, but I can feel it and it, it like moves in my body and it releases and sometimes my body shakes and, you know, some, some knots of energy that are, I guess you might call them like some scars or there's probably different names for them, but that's, that's my main practice. Um, just to get out of my own way. Uh, and the more I can do that and the more I can trust, even though I, oh, there's a part of me that's, I would love to be able to direct it and to control it and to hold on to it. Oh, I wish, I wish I could. I wish it would work, but it doesn't. So it's like, okay, I can trust. I can let go and just see what happens. You know, that that's really where my practice is. Um, oh, that's so exciting. So that is so true. When we can really let go and let the practice unfold of its own accord, it will do it. It knows how to do it. it knows. We just have to get out of the way. Yeah. And what's so interesting in my own journey is the way I had to get out of my own way was judging my own anger, mm -hmm. judging my own bulldog. And it's like, oh, that's really interesting. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. So and it's not, by the way, I have to say, it's not just me. Like I, my, I open my book with something's in the air. Every woman I talk to can feel it. There's something happening at kind of the transpersonal level, whatever you make of that, but it's bigger than any one individual. There's some shift occurring that some rebalancing that's happening. Um, and I think we're all going to be a part of that, like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I, like I, it. 
I totally agree. You can see it. Women from all over the world or even different social movements, whether it's Hong Kong or Myanmar, Thailand. I mean, so many people are drawing on these energies. That's right. And I think, I, you know, I'd be foolish to think this is just the small mind and small selves doing it. I think something's afoot. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Something is afoot. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all the questions today um, because it, it's noon right now and, and you wanted to. Yeah, leave. I would love I would love to do a practice because um, okay. this is a, a, a meditation sangha. Um, yeah, so this is a practice I, de I developed. Um, and, you know, again, I didn't nothing, not, nothing in my book is new. Everything is only repackaged. All of these ideas are so ancient. And what any writer does is just kind of repackage them in a way that may be accessible to people in a slightly different way. So um, it, was, it was something that I work with and I was really trying to be able to hold again, my fierceness, my kind of Kali, my mama bear energy and integrate it uh, with the tenderness at an energetic level. Because at some point when we do it in our mind, it's like oh, the mind is so full of stories. And as, as an insight meditation practitioner, I actually find sometimes it's easier just to drop the story. Like I said, my current practice, I let, I don't even know what I'm letting go of. I'm just working it as energy in the body. There's, there's something really useful of working with these things as energies in the body as opposed to the story. The story is useful too, but... And so this is a practice I developed to use the breath to try to really integrate this yin and the yang energy, kind of the fierce energy, which is part of life, and the tender yin energy, and to try to work with them and help them merge and mingle and in integrate in my body. And so I would love to teach this practice. I would love that. I'm, okay. I, uh, I, I do uh, therapeutic touch, which is similar to Reiki. So energy right. is my thing. I love it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, as a scientist, I can't explain it. And it always makes you feel a little bit un uncomfortable because it sounds woo woo, <laughs> but I'd be foolish if I didn't notice what was going on in my own body. Cause I could, something's happening, you know, right. and it, it's, it's there. It's, it's empirical. It's happening. I'm not making it up just the fact that I can't explain it, you know, well, that's just the limitation of what we know in science at this current point in time. So, <laughs> okay. So yeah, let's, let's do it. Okay. So please. And uh, hopefully we'll have, we might have a matter of we'll time for comments at the end. We, we may, we'll see. Okay. So go ahead and close your eyes or, or you can have them partially closed if you want. You just uh, settle into your body. Maybe just take a few deep, relaxing breaths just to relax your body. And then just letting your breathing return to normal. And your mind will wander. If you can for now, just notice your breathing. Now I'd like you to notice your posture, right? Please make sure that you're sitting up straight. So you're kind of, your, your body is um, embodying a sense of power right, with a straight back. Don't strain it, but really straighten out your spine. And also adopt some sort of touch that feels empowering. This may be putting both hands on your solar plexus, 
which is right below your rib cage and about two or three inches above your belly button. That's one place you can do it. Or else you can put like a fist on your heart if that feels more empowering. Put your hands on your body in some way that makes you feel strong and empowered. Bring your back straight. Really start focusing on your in-breath. Now you'll have to breathe out, of course, but just really put your attention on your inhalation. And as you breathe in, imagine that you're breathing in this fierce young energy. It's rising up your spine and filling your body. You can also add a visual if you like, like a white, bright white light coming in with the breath, filling your body, up your spine. So really just feeling the energy of this, this young energy flowing through up your straight back, the white energy going to every cell, energizing you, empowering you, feeling it flow, letting it flow, giving it permission to flow. Okay, now take a big inhalation in and hold your breath for a few seconds. Hold it, hold it, hold it. And then release, blow it out. And let your breathing return to normal. So now let your posture relax a little bit, soften a little bit. And put your hands in a more soothing place, like maybe your hands over your heart, for instance. Or cradling your face. So some touch that makes you feel more uh, tender and nurtured. Ready, now start to focus on your out breath. Right, the releasing of your out breath. Just feeling yourself relax with each out breath as you let go. So as you're breathing out, imagine that you're breathing out the tender yin energy that's also flowing through your body. Let 
kind of loving, connected presence, that warmth. You might even imagine like a soft golden or pink light that you're breathing out that's flowing through you. Letting this energy really heal you. Nurture you. And then once more, take a deep breath in and hold it. Hold it. And release. And so now what we're going to do is just make sure your body is comfortable. So it's, your back's upright, but not too tense. And we want to place our hands in a way that is both uh, nurturing and supportive. So this may be a fist over our heart with a gentle hand over it. Or maybe one hand on our heart and one hand on our solar plexus. Maybe some physical gesture that makes us feel both tenderly cared for, but also strong and supported. Right. And so now we're going to allow our attention to focus on the in-breath and the out-breath. Right. So imagining that as you're breathing in, you're breathing in this fierce young energy. Right. It's empowering you. And then as you breathe out, you're breathing out that yin, tender energy. It's healing you. Really invite these energies, give them permission to merge and integrate inside your body. Welcome them both. Allow them both to flow. You might even say something internal, internally like, I honor and embrace my fierce and tender side. And I invite both energies to merge and integrate within me. And see if you can, don't try to control it, what they do, just allow this to be as natural as the waves of an ocean, right, in and out. Let nature do all the work. Right, and then for a last time, take one deep breath in. Hold it for a few moments. And release. 
Okay, so releasing the practice, releasing the breath. And then when you're ready, opening your eyes. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was beautiful. Um, you're welcome. So I guess we're out of time. I brought us up to the, to the moment. Sorry about that. But. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to also just dedicate the merit of our time together for the benefit of all beings everywhere. You know, may all beings be held in that field of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, and may all beings be free. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Be well.